Welcome to Point to Rise, your podcast that gives you permission to dream big, take messy action, and turn your talent into profit while turning your back on perfection. My name is Suzanne Purcell, high performance and mindset coach, former international ballerina, profitable entrepreneur, and founder of Point to Rise, a movement designed to empower dancers. It is my mission to use my own story as an inspiration for today's generation of dancers. And now sit back, stretch, warm up, or zip your coffee and love learning how much it matters to point at yourself first to rise to all that you are capable of. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Point to Rise podcast. I am so grateful that you guys have tuned in today. My special guest today is Undine, and she is a Dr. Pilates certified instructor with a solid expertise in and passion for dance. A trained NLP coach, Undine also provides mental coaching and career management guidance. Well, it is morning here. Good evening, Undine. Thank you so much for being here today. I have been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. Worthy. Well, thank you for having me. I didn't know I had anything interesting to say. So, <laughs> oh, we are also beyond that. Um, <laughs> so, before we start today, we'll just start with like um, a few icebreaking questions. Born and raised. Shoot. Where were you Sorry? born? Where were you born and raised, and where do you live I... now? I was born in France, in north of France, in Normandy, actually. Then I moved to Morocco when I was four months, because that was back in the time where you wouldn't give birth in Morocco if you were French. Don't ask me why, that's just what people think at that time. Um, so I was born in France, but actually my parents were living in Morocco back then. And I was raised there for four years. I absolutely do not remember anything except that Arabic language is a beautiful language. That's mm -hmm. what I can remember. And then I was raised in France for many years. And then I moved to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And now I'm back in Paris. In Paris. Beautiful. Um, thank you. You moved around quite a bit. Nice. Yes. <laughs> I'm a traveler. Um, your favorite childhood memory? Oh, <laughs> probably my first performance on stage. It was probably rubbish because I was something like five. But I will always remember it was on Queen. The show must go on. And I just remember the music. The stage is all black. The audience is just black. And there's this music that is so powerful. Mm. And I walk on stage. I don't remember anything after that. I just remember walking on stage and there's this music and it's all black and it's paradise. Wow, that's powerful. Hey, well, let's go. Well, how did you come to dance? Like, what was it inside you that drew you in? I come from a family of non-professional dancers. Um, my mom has danced all her life. She's 76, I think now, and she's still dancing. Um, her mom used to love to dance, but it was a time where you wouldn't really have ballet classes for little girls. Um, so my mom is maybe the first dancer in the family. My father also was dancing. Um, so that was kind of a normal activity to try when you're a kid in my family. And I just love music. I actually... Okay. I have no idea why I loved it. I just love it. We yeah, need to know why. Great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can relate. Yeah. Um, hey. What else? Oh, yeah. Let's see. What what book are you currently reading? Oh. <laughs> or I how was many reading... are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> I actually stopped that habit of reading three different books at the same time. It was draining because, yeah, I don't know. I... I I couldn't figure out which book to read. So I was reading three in a row or three at the same time. Sorry. And I've changed that habit because I actually felt it was overwhelming. And it takes so long to actually finish any of them. So now I'm just like one at a time. 
I was reading Ondine this weekend uh, because there was a conversation with a friend of mine last week and we disagreed on the end of the, the story. Um, and it depends on the version of which books you're reading, which theater play you're reading. So I just wanted to be sure that I was right. And of course, I was right. <laughs> and I started yesterday morning the biography of Irek Mohamedov because I'm planning to ask him for an interview. So I wanted to do some background research. Okay, for, for people who don't know who that is, including me, who is that person? Irek Mohamedov is probably one of the greatest dancer in the world. Um, is a former Bolshoi principal dancer back in the 80s, moved to the Royal Ballet in late 80s, early 90s, late 80s, I think and stayed with Royal Ballet until the end of his career. Uh, he's really famous for Spartacus role, which probably is something that suits him very well in, his, in the way he dances. But he's actually most famous for being the lead male dancer of all Macmillan's um, creations in the 80s and until Macmillan's death, actually. That was his favorite male dancer. And luckily for me, he's in Paris now. So Oh, perfect. You can just yeah. go and have coffee with him and do it in, in person. <laughs> yeah. It's it's actually a funny story, if you don't mind. Oh no, I please in, I, share. <laughs> so I've known Irak Mohamedov as a dancer for many, many years. I was in Amsterdam to visit my friend Cristiano Principato. And he invited me to go to a party that was a farewell party for a couple of dancers, including Sasha Mohamedov, which for whatever reason, I've never linked her last name with Irek's last name. It was just like, okay. <laughs> I'm chit-chatting with her on the balcony and she mentioned her father two or three times uh, because she was talking about her holidays and she was saying, oh, maybe I'll go with my father, but it depends on his work. So at some point I'm like, oh, what is your father's work? She looked at me like this. <laughs> and then she's actually happy because it turns out that she's actually happy when people don't know who her father is. <laughs> and she said, it's uh, Irak Mohamedov. And then I was like, the dancer? <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> and she was like, yes. <laughs> wow. And it was, it was just funny because she then realized that I actually had no idea who she was. I knew who she was. I just didn't know who her father was or you I, didn't I would make the that. Yeah. Well, look at me. I didn't know who he was. Well, so, you know, we cannot know everyone in the world. Exactly. And that's okay. I just had a quick exactly. conversation with myself saying, oh my gosh, this is really stupid, Susie. You should know everybody. And then I was like, no, you don't. No, you don't. No. No, you don't. But I definitely recommend, if you don't know Irak, to check him out. There's oh, I beautiful will. videos of him. Oh, the best one. Um, Manon mm. with Alessandra Ferri. The most oh. beautiful Manon I've ever seen, ever. Well, I shall do that. And I will report back. Okay. And so, it's okay if you don't like it. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Well, yeah, of course. That's. I'm not going to just tell you I like it. Let's um, let's let's make this all about you. So tell me, tell tell us a little bit about your journey. So what we know so far is that you just love dancing, music, and you just. So what was your your way from five years old standing on stage and now being the founder of Corda Ballet? And what you're doing now like how did you I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a, a a long stretch to explain but please take your time because that is the that's the interesting thing that shows the possibilities you know it shows that we are all capable of everything that we want yeah we are and the thing I realized growing up is the thing we want to be when we're kids Sometimes it turns out that we do that, but it can be in very different and mysterious ways. Um, so I'm a very curious person and I, learn, I love to learn 
and to discover new things. Like when I was a kid, I would always ask lots of questions and maybe because both of my parents are teachers, they nurture that a lot. So we have questions, they talk to us how to look for the answer and ask for more questions, not stay at that answer and then ask for more questions and ask for more questions. So trust me, the encyclopedia, we used it a lot. <laughs> back oh, awesome. forth and back and forth. Yeah, no, that's such a beautiful way of encouraging your children to always ask questions. To always ask questions and never settle on this is the answer. Can but so I have the settling that no, because it's so beautiful. It's what I what I actually truly believe is what holds us back is settling for an answer. Yeah that we're actually looking for answers versus for more questions to ask. Yeah, and actually, if I can make a parenthesis here, I, I am really glad that I was brought up this way because I realized that I'm a generation that, that witnessed a change in how we use knowledge. When my parents were in charge of the world um, and active in life, and back then, you had to know the answer by a good employee is someone who knows the answer to a problem, how to solve it, how to resolve it. And I witnessed a shift that I guess millennials will not know because they grew up with the result of the shift. And the shift was with internet and Wikipedia and Google and everything, the knowledge is right here. You can just type something and you get the answer. The key became to make sense of it, to find it fast, but most importantly, to make sense of it, to be able to analyze it, to be able to cross-reference things. And I didn't notice that until really recently. Um, it's a huge change in the way we approach knowledge and what makes us valuable in this world is this ability not to find the answer because the answer is actually very easy to find. Just Google anything. I mean, Google became a word. <laughs> exactly. Just Google anything, and then you you get the answer. But how do you use this answer? How do you make use of it? Is a completely different story. Well, beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, if I want to put my two cents to this, if you don't mind, it's what we're seeing. Particularly for me, I have kids. You know, I see how they're. <clears throat> what the expectations are in the school system, for example, on how to learn and, and how we teach, what mm -hmm. they are learning, where everything that is really needed is available on Google and so much more. Um, it is the importance that we, we know where to find it versus to obtain everything no. ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. or know exactly where to go for certain knowledge that we are in, in need of versus um, just relying on somebody else to tell us. It's that somebody is giving us the food or we are learning for ourselves to hunt. Yes, exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. So thank you for that insight. And I, I think that is, you know, I know that's the, it is such a more beautiful way to live and go through life and you will find so much more joy when you ask more questions. I don't know any other way, but I love my way. Awesome. <laughs> Good. Okay. So that is how you were brought up. Um, yeah. So um, my background is very mixed, very unusual, I would say, for someone who works with dancers. I've actually started studying foreign languages and internal relations, internal international relations. Um, I was curious about the world we live in i was curious about everything basically so for me learning languages was the key to communicating to so many people um so i wanted to learn all the languages in the world i've settled with six um that's more than enough <laughs> but from time to time i start learning a new one and i've worked in diplomacy i've worked in bear with me i've worked in nuclear power plants um mind blowing but I've always... <laughs> awesome i love it just love it but on the side i've always been dancing um i've always listened to music it's always been a very important 
part of my life. But I think what was most important in my life is that I, I learned the piano and I gave up. I learned sketching and drawing and I gave up. And I learned the guitar and I gave up. But then I realized that I was not giving up. I realized that I'm just this kind of person who likes to learn and know a little bit of a lot of different things. It gets me excited. Then it's just that I have enough of this and I want to discover and learn something else. And so it changed my mindset because I thought that I was not someone who managed to go through because I thought I was giving up. But I changed this mindset and I shifted from, no, actually, it's just that this is who I am. This is what I like. I don't like to be an expert in all of these things. I like to know a little bit of everything. And most importantly, I like to know the person that I can reach out to who is the expert, who will give me the rest of the information that I'm not actually interested in knowing by myself. So basically I have my Google network <laughs> of real life people. And to make that long story shorter, this is what Core de Ballet is all about. It, it came to me as I want it to be the platform where you come to with question and I can direct you to, hey, here's the right person for you. It's not me. It's going to be, I don't know, someone who's expert in nutrition, someone who knows so much about anatomy applied for dancers, someone who's a really good ballet teacher, someone who's a really good Pilates instructor, mental coach, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's so many things that we can um, learn from to empower ourselves and have better career, longer career, healthier career, be full-fledged artists. Um, so that's a little bit my experience. It's learning who I was and what I was good at and what I love to and applying that into the business that I, I created instead of trying to be someone I wasn't. Ah, yes. So we, yes, yes, we do that sometimes to ourselves. We try we to do be that. Some, we do that a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's get into where does, where did the idea of Corte Ballet come from? Like where, and it's not like the, the building out and, and, uh, how it and what it does at the very moment, but what is its heart and soul? It's it's very similar. It's a long, you know, it's a long development. You know how it is when you create a business, it actually comes from a, a long, long process of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I would say the real star was when I moved to Abu Dhabi because I couldn't find good ballet classes uh, for adults. I actually could say I couldn't find good ballet classes at all. Uh, <laughs> so um, I started being in a foreign country where there are not that many ballet classes, very different from the big cities in Europe and, and New York, or New York, the US, you know, where you can easily find a center where you have really high level classes for amateur dancers who could be former professional dancer who stopped for whatever reason, or people who've always been amateur dancer, but they've been dancing for so long that their level is actually very good. Mm -hmm. um, and they're far from beginners and they're far from intermediate. They're really good advanced amateur adult dancers. You don't have that in, in the Gulf anywhere. So I didn't really want to stop dancing. So I started going to Europe, buying all the DVDs I could, watch them at home. Um, of course, my living room had no dining table because, you know, you need the space. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no coffee table either. You just sit on the floor. Sorry, friends, but this is my dance studio. <laughs> right. um, but then I got bored of my DVDs because same thing. Like that was 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago, there were not that many DVD. And I started thinking that would be so great if all of this was online, you know, so we could train wherever we are. And 
some of my friends were professional dancers and for them it was more well, when I travel for gala, sometimes I don't have a coach with me. I don't have a teacher. I'm not really good at creating a class because it's it's a skill to know how to create a good class. And um, I started thinking about all of the things we could do online, how we could help dancers all over the world, how we could think a little bit outside of the box and stop thinking you make a dancer only in the studio. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. No, being a dancer is like any job. It's a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge, a lot of curiosity that you feed through so many different things. It doesn't stop at the studio. It doesn't stop at the studio. I just want to hone in there. It doesn't stop at the studio and it doesn't start at the studio. You stop and start where you want. You yes. decide. Exactly. Um, and this this old belief of it only is happening in the studio is something that is old and how it used to be maybe in the 70s and 80s. It is not like that anymore. Diversity is where it's at, I would say. Yeah. And even further than that, I noticed that it was really helpful during the first quarantine times last year because of that mindset that I have that, you know, you can improve even your technique while you're brushing your teeth or washing the dishes by just knowing some principles and applying them into how you move. Simple movement that you do every day. That would be so much more powerful than waiting until you're in the studio, waiting until you're in class and you have so many things to think about. And that's the only moment that you work on your turnout, your extension, your posture etc etc so when the quarantine time started to happen everywhere last year i felt i was not that overwhelmed because suddenly it was like well it's just okay. business as usual <laughs> except that mm, well there is no time we go to the studio anymore but you know what it's more time actually because i don't have to commute go to the studio the studio is my living room now hmm Okay. Of course, I'm. I'm like everyone. I got really bored of that after two months. But <laughs> well, I'm sure we all are in in a way with bored with everything that we consume over and over and over again, right? Like even I can only imagine that with being pulled out of the studio was perhaps something exciting in the mm -hmm. beginning, something to explore if you have an open mindset. It's like oh, okay, well, well, let's see where we're at. But like after a month or two, that that then will become boring again. As, yeah, it does. So, right? And we're, we're still somewhere in the same boat after a year. Um, I noticed that you also offer mindset coaching. And um, why do you think that is important, particularly for dancers? Um. Mental coaching, I think, is important for anyone. I witness its power. When I actually met two of my colleagues who were um, neurolinguistic program programming um, certified people, don't really know how to call that because I'm not a big fan of the whole certification process. Um, but they were knowledgeable in neuro-linguistic programming, I would say. And I noticed how they behave differently in work and how they were getting efficient and positive and healthy results with their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And that puzzled me. And of course, I'm curious. So I started asking questions and it turns out that both of them, <laughs> so the two people that I realized were very different, we're both neurolinguistic programming experts. So I started asking about that because at first I felt it was a bit of a guru thing, you know, like hypnotize it. Oh, uh, yeah. Hypnosis. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And, but so talking to them and because I had a lot of trust towards them, I started thinking, okay, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I have preconception about what that is. And I started asking a lot of questions and realizing that a lot of what they were talking about was basic mental coaching mm -hmm. techniques. And that's because actually NLP took from psychology, 
um, grew as their own field and technique. And then a lot of that was then used and applied by sport coach. And actually one of my colleagues was a coach for a national team in a sport that he's never played. <laughs> wow, awesome. A very, yeah, and it, but he was a coach for the national team um, because he didn't have to know the game. All he had to know is how do we get the best out of those players? And that really interested me because I was already thinking about corps de ballet and I was thinking that's something very foreign to the ballet world. All of the things that you're talking about, empowering the person, asking them questions before giving them feedback. What? what? <laughs> giving them um, feedback? <laughs> being constructive and positive doesn't mean you're always saying only the nice things. But when you have to say things that do not go well, there is a very structured way that you use to make sure that the person actually listens to it, use it, Amen. and then and then grow from that. And that's what I call empowerment, you know. And of course, like anything, I wanted to learn. So I took a course in NLP coaching and NLP, because it's not just NLP for me. NLP is really a, a, a series of tools and techniques that you apply to whatever you want. Mm. So I've learned coaching and I've learned NLP techniques as well. I don't like all of them. Um, some of them are a bit on the who side for me, um, but I think it's just a matter of personal taste, what works for you as a coach and what works for the person that you're coaching. So it's great to learn all of it. So that you can see and pick what works for you and create your own style. Before the coaching, I definitely embraced it a hundred percent because I was one of those people who would be actually mean. But I only see it now. For me, I was just efficient. You know, just like get to the point. Just, just like, move on. Yeah, just move on. I mean, this is rubbish. This is rubbish. That that's what I would do naturally. It's just, just rubbish. What you're giving me is rubbish. But, you know, seeing the power of just applying yourself and using different ways of communicating and you get so much better results, then it's worth it. It's worth fighting your nature. Well, and let's get into that a little bit, because I, I don't think it's actually our nature. Like coming from a place of lack and fear because that is what we we are coming from when we are not not direct but when we're giving feedback in a way that is not helpful but actually emp not empowering the other person but taking their power away you yeah. know you can tell somebody hey what you just did sucked or you can put it in a completely different context that they still understand that that wasn't the highest level that they performed on, mm -hmm. but it doesn't define who they are. Definitely. And, and most of the time they already know actually, so. Exactly, but what I'm saying is that we have this, or we, the ballet world, the dance world has this belief adapted that only through harshness and through really strong words results will be aspire and there are so many other words when you just look at great leaders nowadays on how they actually leading their teams on how mm -hmm. their how their day-to-day -day interaction really looks like and when i look at you know um feedback pinned on a board after a performance then that gives me open eyes to what we can adapt in the ballet world in, in terms of leadership and really coaching. Like a coach is not there to tell you what you're doing wrong. A coach is there what you know, but can't really tell yourself because that is human nature. Like we are not getting ourselves outside of the comfort zone if we don't really have to. If that carrot yeah. that is dingling in front of us isn't big enough, we're not doing it who we are that's very true to be honest with you i i agree with the nature thing at mm -hmm. the same time i was lucky enough not to have ballet teacher who were that kind of teacher awesome um when i look back all of my teachers were 
very demanding for sure um asking for the best for sure but they were not mean i, I don't remember any time where it wasn't really warranted or they said things that were defining us instead of talking about some steps that we've done so I, I i think that actually also helped me having a positive view on all of that because i know that there are still a lot of teachers one not like this right. the problem is probably that there are not that many who are in position of high power so we don't really see them or they do not have as much power as the others and it's the balance between these kind of teachers and those kind of teacher that makes us see the ballet world as sometimes so negative makes us see the so i i actually i don't see it as negative i see it as and i i want to see it as and i'm i'm sure you do too like it's full of possibilities I think I think you're coaching me. <laughs> what's that? Sorry, you're coaching me. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with it, but I I just want to really hone in that neither you or I say that it's bad or negative. No, it's not. what you and I are really are about is finding solutions. We're about Definitely. seeing all the possibilities because we keep asking more questions. And, and to be honest, I definitely think 100% that most of the behavior that we see that are not helpful come from a good place. It comes from the person who's doing that think this is the best way to get the result. I've had that conversation so many times with so many teachers. And actually in my workplace, when I learned NLP, the reason why I saw the difference between the two person I was talking about and others is because you had the other kind. And I had that conversation with them once because they lashed out during a meeting publicly in front of 20 other people saying really, really bad thing to someone. And their answer to that behavior was sometimes we're in a place of power, you have to make a point. And I said, yeah, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying, did that have to be public in front of everyone? Well, no. No, it doesn't. And it takes you could have made process. them make the same point. I said, maybe you have to make that point. I am no one to judge that. But doing that privately would have completely changed the way the person would have received that feedback. They would probably have received it saying, OK, I made a big mistake. That person is really unhappy. I have to solve it. Whereas here, they felt humiliated. Then what do you do when you feel humiliated? You don't even listen to what the person has said. You push it away, you brush it away. No. Whatever you're saying, I, I don't care. It doesn't produce any kind of anything really, except fear that I can't do anything wrong again because I'm going to be yelled at like that once again. Exactly. Um, but the person who did that really believed that was the way to get the result they were looking for. And so where does that the part where from? What do it you think? Past. What's that? In, in that specific case, it was because it worked in the past. It worked for me. I'm not offended when people behave like that with me. Yeah, but we're all different. It worked in the past, maybe once. But what about the hundred times it failed? But we don't know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and so for it's me, it's the, 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 the lack of asking questions to actually challenge. Did it really work? Mm -hmm. So it's not it, about it's, the feedback itself, or it's not about the message, but how it's being delivered. Yeah. Definitely. And that is the same in the studios. That's the same in, you know, in companies. It is not about the message. It is about the delivery, the inability to, to step into a true leadership position. And mm -hmm. I am not blaming I'm just saying, if you're a great dancer, that's not necessarily right away make you a great leader. This is something, a, a, a knowledge, a position that you have to learn if you're in a position like that. Yeah. And the two examples I gave, 
are people who wanted to be great leaders. So they went out and looked for what are the great courses, what are the great tools, what are the great techniques that I can learn to be a better leader. And it goes back to being curious, educate yourself and apply that. Mm -hmm. Know when you can apply which tools and which knowledge that you, that you know. And as you said, can be a great dancer, doesn't necessarily make you a great teacher. You can be a great teacher, you don't have to be a great dancer. Doesn't, and you can be a great teacher, it doesn't mean you're gonna be a great director. Yeah. So many different jobs that you always have to remind yourself, okay, in which position am I today? What do I know? What do I not know? How do I get better? How do I get better? I think that is a great question. Um, particularly teachers, and I'm saying should on purpose, should ask themselves every single day. I ask myself that every single day. What can I do today that will push myself or my business forward? Um, and I- The best I, teachers do. And the best teachers do. And the, from the conversations that I've had, that sounded like a foreign language. Well, I am in this position now. Why do I need to learn? Why do I need to do this? It's like understanding that we, we don't arrive somewhere. Life is a journey. We're not arriving at one point and then you're, you're done with something. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take myself as an example. Um, when I left ballet school, when I was 18, I was under the assumption that I cannot learn anymore, that I have to be perfect in my my knowledge and my education as a dancer at everything that I'm setting out to do, I already should know all of this because I went through eight years of training and that mm -hmm. should have taught me everything I need to know. And with that kind of a mindset, I completely closed myself off to the best opportunities that were out there to learn. Like this whole curiosity, I took that completely away from me with that kind of a mindset. And I just I rediscovered that, that. I found that very interesting that you say that because I'm now in a position where I work a lot with dancers and teachers. Mm -hmm. So I get both sides you know, of, um, of the thing. And a lot of teacher in professional companies are complaining that they cannot correct or give feedback to some pro dancers because they don't listen. And I, I remember having a conversation because I was witnessing a, a professional company class and I felt that there was not much correction, there were not much guidance. So I was like, is that a warm up? Because even a warm up, shouldn't you give some guidance because they're going to go on stage? So I had all those questions and I was good friend with the teacher. So I could be very open and say, basically, why are you not saying anything? Is it you, you don't see it or what? <laughs> and the person said, no, I see it. And he hurt my eyes. But what can I do? When I say things, they get offended. Hmm. So I started listening to other teachers and I started observing company classes. And I said, yeah, but you're kind of building that environment where you are not correcting anymore when they get to company. So they come out of school, they're being talked every single minute what to do, what not to do. This is good, this is wrong, this is good, this is wrong. That's basically a class, uh, school class. And then they go to company and then suddenly it's just, okay, plié, tendu, travail, grand battement, pirouette, bye. So I said, it's, you're, you're, you're the teachers in the company, so aren't you a little bit responsible? for their environment. But then they said what you said, that yes, but at the same time, the dancers feel that because they're in a company, they don't have to learn anymore. And it's very interesting that you say that because it gives me a little bit more insight on, like on the other side, it's not that the dancer are all thinking they know everything. It's because they've been they, they, they've been given the idea that when they reach to a company, they should know everything. Oh, this is so good. I, I have goosebumps everywhere. Let's go a little deeper into that. So have you, have you asked 
but you had the chance or somebody that would be open to actually understand why they are offended like why are dancers offended besides the fact that they think they should not make any mistakes anymore or that they don't have mistakes because when we have that kind of mindset we are closing ourselves off to anything and everything else um do, do you think there's another reason for that i'm still working on it because that's one of the subjects i want to touch on in, in coaching because i want to start broadening the coaching so it's not just just dancers because I, I think we need to help everybody because everybody has their 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 part in it and i do hear from a lot of teachers that they, they actually want to play their role in helping and developing their dancers um but like everything they need help with knowing what tool to use and, and understanding that deep down it's a lot of belief that are both from the teacher part and both from the the students now dancers part that this is the way a company class run and as you know belief dictates your behavior and then your behavior dictates everything that is happening in your environment so we need to go into understanding where that beliefs come from and for me it comes from school time Mm -hmm. at school there is there are Things that are being done or being said consciously or unconsciously, and I'm probably sure it's unconscious mainly, that makes the students believe that, okay, I need to be, as you said, I need to be perfect when I'm 17, 18, 19, when I graduate. Very recently, I did a filming of coaching session. Um, I was filming principal dancers teaching younger dancers their first time dancing a new role. And I asked a couple of my students, they were 12, 13 year old to assist so that they can see how it is when, when you're 25 and you're being coached by a former principal dancer. And all of them said something that surprised me. And at the same time did not surprise me. They all said it was reassuring to see an adult professional dancer being given so many corrections interesting Hmm. and then it struck me because i was like they're 12 and 13 and they do not know that this is the life of a professional dancer it doesn't stop at school so i talked to friends who were in their early 20s so they they recently left school and they're recent in the company and they all said the same thing they said yes when i was their age I thought the same thing. I thought you get to a company, you're perfect. You're not being corrected anymore. They give you a role. Bear with me. You rehearse it once, then you go on stage. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. But that's what it is, right? Hearing, so those 12 year old hearing that sometimes it takes a month to learn an entire character role because um, you don't have one variation. And even if you're called the ballet, you have the entire ballet basically to know. It takes a month, three okay. weeks, two weeks, depending on the company. But even the company that goes with very tight schedule, it's because they dance it a lot. So most of the dancer already know it. When you're new in the company, well, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> you have only two weeks, but that's because it's something that they dance a lot. Usually you have like four weeks. And that was a realization for me because I realized they don't see that. They don't know it. So this is information that is crucial for them understanding what their job will be. Mm. And that's a job description, right? And for me, that's what school is supposed to prepare you for. Making sure that you understand what the job will be. And the job will be to be in a rehearsal for weeks and weeks and weeks because it has to be perfect. So this level of being corrected, being given feedback, being very precise on details, everything matters is not going to stop the day you you graduate. Okay. I just heard something that you said. You said it has to be perfect. So yeah. we both know that that is the expectation in a dance world, in the ballet world. So is it bear, bear with me or at least this is what we're assuming and when I say we I'm I'm talking about the dancers in some way or another 
And speaking from my own experience, I mean, the rehearsals, it was all about perfection. It was all about the perfect line, the legs on the same height, the what makes the white ballet so beautiful, for example, right? Um, and, but what I find or what I'm assuming, or it's, it's, it's just really a thought for me is that when we are putting on this perfection cap that you only can be perfect, we, we, you and I know that's an illusion. Like it always will be in the eye of the beholder, whether or not it was perfect or not. What, what's perfect for me is different for you. Um, but when directors and, and, and teachers are putting that into our souls over and over and over again, we believe that we are only successful when we're perfect. But with perfection, you are cutting off your ability to learn. And, and this for is me, where... perfection is perfection is also a dead end because yeah. I I I associate the word perfection with a still image, and I, I I tend to coach people to remove that word perfection from their vocabulary and replace it with something else. Usually, when I coach, I let them find what it is. For me, what worked was excellence. Same here. Because excellence in my mind is something a little bit more fluid. It has nuances. It's it's moving, first of all. I mean, you can see I'm moving already. <laughs> it, it, excellence is fluid. It's moving. It has nuances. It has dynamics. So it allows for, especially in ballet or dance, any kind of dance, it allows for these little differences from the premiere and the second and the third time you dance it and the fourth time. So it allow it to be alive and yes of course if you're called de ballet you're going to look for certain lines and certain expectations and on how the entire thing can can look like but it's not going to be static mm. and that's the difference static there is there and is it no shouldn't else. be static yeah and perfection or the word perfection for me is as for you static there's no nowhere else to go. You can't go right or left or up or down. It's just that, yeah. right? And what I really wanted to get across is that that thinking that when you get to a company that your learning journey has ended, I think correlates with the understanding that you have to be perfect in order to be a part of a company, to perform every night, to, you mm -hmm. know, there is no room for learning. There is no room for mistakes because when we make mistakes, it's not beautiful. And when ballet isn't beautiful, the audience will not come. And when the audience will not come, we're not making any money. And when we're not making any money, we're dead. But it's, then here's a question. If there is no room for learning, how do you explain the difference between being a core ballet member and a principal dancer? Exactly. How did that happen? Exactly. Exactly, exactly my point. So and when that, we're we're nurturing that mindset, we're overwhelming the young dancers with the idea that when they graduate, they already should be principal dancer level. Mm -hmm. And well, no, you're not going to be at that level. You still have to learn a lot, and then at some point, maybe, maybe not, you reach that level. Do you think, so um, again, I'm going to go back to, to what I was taught and told when I left school is here's what you have to do. Company class will never be enough. You will have to do an extra two hours in the studio after every day of rehearsal in order to maintain your technique. That was my, that was my gift from my teacher when I left and I didn't have the cap capability or capacity, nor did I have the motivation to do that. Um, but I didn't know how to lead myself at that point. I've never learned that in school. I only knew how to function when somebody told me what to do. Mm -hmm. um, that was my understanding and learning is to just do more of the same thing. 
That was the only thing. And mm -hmm. I so don't agree with that anymore at all. It is not about doing the same thing over and over and over again until, you know, you, you can't even look at yourself anymore. Learning is about finding different ways on how to approach what isn't working yet. Definitely. Isn't yeah, it? Definitely. Like I, you need, you, you, yeah, you, you, you need to, I mean, you, if you've tried a couple of things, a couple of times the same thing and it's not giving the results, then there is something that needs to be changed. Okay. So either you actually can't do that thing, but that's a bit demotivating. So let's not go this way. Or you need to find another approach. And that's when being curious and having other interest, uh, point of interest or their hobbies can actually help. Mm -hmm. And, and as this coming from someone who's so obsessed with ballet that there is very little room for anything else. Um, but I know from time to time when to turn that off and go and do something else. What I really love, for example, is watch documentaries. But and then if you think of it, all the things that I watch have a very, very um, important artistic part in it. The I've, I've watched all of RuPaul Drag Race episodes you have no idea how much <laughs> how much inspiration it gave me for my classes the my students who knew which episode i had watched would know <laughs> when the class come why i'm asking them that kind of task that kind of challenge because i got the idea from rupal but like who would think that rupal drag race can give you inspiration for a pilates class well, it does. <laughs> because we, not we, I, I find that the industry has the belief that Bali only gets better through the knowledge of Bali and that we can't draw knowledge from other fears and other um, competencies into the world and, and combining it. Um, I find it is a very it can be at times a very elite kind of bubble that doesn't want to allow any other kind of thinking or expertise in. You can, you can find any kind of strengths or correlation in, in everything that we're doing, in, in every documentary, in, in, in other people, in athletes, in actors, you can always learn something from them if you are looking at it with an open mind and you ask yourself the question, what can I learn from them? What speaks to me versus, oh, this is not for me. He or she is not a dancer, so she doesn't understand. Definitely. You know what I mean? And I would actually say history proved this thinking completely wrong. If you look at the rise and fall of big empires, when do they fall? When they don't open up to the outside, maybe because they're too big that there is no outside. I mean, if you take Rome Empire, stop why? Because there was no interaction with others, no renewal of a new thinking, no change, no. So it, it, it just just end up disappearing because you start thinking I'm the best when you're not. So someone else has an idea. And you're too slow to react to that. And if I think of the ballet word example the first example that always come to my mind for that is Rudolf Noriev who was the most curious man I can think of but there are probably others but his biography are really always stressing the fact that he used to spend so much time going to museum private collection learning from different kind of art and like him or not as a dancer, like him or not as a choreographer, you cannot say that you don't see this richness, this diversity of backgrounds in what he was creating. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, it's like any kind of art, but you see that it's rich and intense and it, it, it takes from, um, takes from uh, painting, it takes from sculpture, it, it, it we would take from music, he's really rich in, in music. The, Costumes are always so extravagant. Uh, again, that's what I'm saying. You like it or you don't. <laughs> but, 
because Balanchine, for example, will be the complete opposite in the way you think about the costume. That's probably the the, the cheapest in terms of how much um, um, detail is in it, but it doesn't mean it's cheap in terms of it's not good quality. And they're the complete opposite. But both of them were really curious people who would feed their artistry from all that curiosity. So I think actually his story tells us, no, you have to open yourself to the rest of the world. You have to go and travel. You have to go and meet other people. And I would have to say, actually, it's OK if they're all from the ballet world. But just go out there to another company, to another country. Meet other fellow dancers, meet other fellow directors. And maybe they will know people from a different field mm -hmm. if you're not really interested in these things. And even you can find inspiration in things that are not artistic. I find inspiration in math. Yeah, that was so good. Thank you. And that's a great segue. I would love you to just talk about what you're offering right now in Corps de Ballet. What is your, what are your next, what's your next vision for it? Next. Well, the current vision is current vision for Cordoballi is to be a platform for pro dancers, dancers in training, teachers as well, because I think they're very key to the development and growth of dancers. To be a platform where you can find all the information that you need to develop your career, become better artists. Because for me, it's very important to understand that it's not all about technique. Technique is important, like in any artistic field. The technique is the basis for you to create what you want to communicate. So technique is one, but at the end of the day, our job is bigger than the technique. And I want Core de Ballet to be that platform where you can have all this information. And as I said earlier, because I want to give an opportunity for a lot of different experts to share this information. Because we're all about, we love to know and learn things and then share it with the rest, share it with the rest of the world, share it with people who would use this information and then do something with it. The next step for me is to actually go deeper in the history of ballet. I really want to go into understanding why are we dancing Giselle the way we dance? Why are the, uh, why is the Bolshoi version different from the Royal Ballet version? What is it actually saying? What is the job of a choreographer in all of that? Did he make the step annoying just to be annoying? Because that's what we think sometimes. <laughs> why is it so fast? <laughs> there is a reason behind anything for good choreographers. But we, let's start with the assumption that this is good choreography from good choreographers. <laughs> there is a reason behind anything that they do. And the more you know that, the easier your job is actually. Mm. Yes, because the more you know, the more you can, the more you know the why, the, the easier it is for you to to do or to in interpret or to yeah. um to make just, it your own or yeah to make it your own or or to decide you know what that is not for me this is so against who i am and who i want to be i cannot be involved i i remember um i actually had the privilege to, i was 18 and norea was staging sleeping beauty that was his last project before he passed away actually uh, in Berlin at the State Opera. And I had, oh gosh, he was sitting there and I was scared to my bones because he was not a great leader. He was yelling and screaming. Just to be around him though was a magic. And it, it just sparked, yes, the costumes, oh my gosh, how how rich they were and how sparkly and how heavy the hat pieces were. It's like, how am I supposed to dance with that? However, we did it and we got used to it, you know? Um, and to 
to see him. He did the car boss for the first couple of performances before he got really sick. And he was a completely different person when he was on stage with us. I mean, he was that, that inspiration, that love, that charismatic man that could just draw you in regardless with, you just had to stand there. And that came from all the knowledge that he had acquired during his, you know, lifetime. Yeah, yeah. and started very early. And he started very early. That, that would be my message to everyone. It's never too late to start, but like be curious and ask lots of questions. So good. Um, my last question to you. Going back with what you know right now, what would you tell your 16-year-old self today? Oh, go for it, because it's fun. <laughs> I, I think the first instinct is we want to change everything. But you know, at the end of the day, we are where we are now because of all the choices we made. And would I be in a better place if I changed? Of course, there's many things I want to change. But would I be in a better place? I don't know. So... I think, yeah, I would just tell myself, just go for it. Trust yourself. Do you remember our first conversation that we had? Yeah. You you coached me on, which I was very grateful for. Um, I think I was a little bit, not complaining, but mentioning how, you know, how hard those years were um, in school and in the company and you said, well, but then you wouldn't be and you wouldn't do what you do today. And it's the truth. Like everything, hard or not, painful or not, that we experience, it depends on how we see it. Perspective is everything. If we think, oh my gosh, poor me, and we take on that victim mentality, then that's what we are going to create in our life and that's what we're going to experience and if we look at it as like a gift and you know what yes it was hard but I wouldn't know much about myself mm -hmm. or the industry or what I want to do and what my purpose is if I hadn't gone through that if I hadn't taken every single step of the way yeah. so what I'm but, saying but, it, but I, it's yeah. hard but it's hard to get through that. I guess you and I, we went through a difficult time realizing this. And it's important to tell also the younger ones, it, it is okay if it takes time and it's actually really hard to go from the mentality of being a victim and being empowered and being, I guess the word we use is resilient. The ability to face whatever is happening to you and don't really like to say, make it a positive, but at least make it an experience that allows you to grow and move forward. It is, it takes time and it is hard. So and it's I, not as easy as just tell yourself it's okay. No. No. And if that came across that way, that's not what I intended to. It is every, every hard experience, every rock bottom is hard. And it doesn't feel good to be in there. And no. it, it puts a lot of pressure on you. And we put a lot of judgment on ourselves. And when we learn that that is actually part of life, that everybody goes that way, that every injury, every cut is an opportunity to learn from, then I, I am more willing to experience those rock bottoms because I know the other side, when I get back up again, I will be so much stronger. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. I, I just, I love it because you challenge me. Um, and <laughs> no, you do. And that's awesome. Like, that's exactly what I, what I want. Um, and it's, it's not only challenging my, it's challenging my ego too. And that would oh, be good. I didn't know I did that. I thought it was no, just please, a normal don't. conversation. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that's great. It, it just shows me it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me and where I'm at. Um, and 
just finding myself like, oh, why don't I know this? Oh, why don't I? Why can't I respond? Why is it taking me so long? Why am I not asking the right questions? And that judgment, just witnessing it from the outside um, is, is such a great experience for me. So thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. I, I so truly believe in your mission um, and always a supporter over here in Western Canada. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was really great to talk to you. And uh, I actually think that what we did today was to actually get to know from other people and stretch our minds. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, my darling. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If this message resonates with you, please pass it on to someone who needs to hear this right now. And if you like what you've heard, your feedback will go a very long way. If you just take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review, that would mean the world to me. Till next time, point at yourself to rise to all that you are capable of.